Fourier series is one of the coolest equations I've encountered in high-level mathematics. The intuition behind it didn't really click for me until I had it explained through the lenses of linear algebra, and so that's what I'm going to do in this video. I'm going to explain how the magic behind the Fourier series is an extension of simple linear algebra, and then apply our knowledge to animate some fun 2D drawings. Uh, and that idea was inspired by the YouTube channel 3Blue1Brown, where he does the same thing. Okay, let's jump into some simple linear algebra. So let's take the case where we have a vector v3 in the 2D space, and two basis vectors v1 and v2 that are orthogonal to each other. Uh, we know that we can write v3 as a linear combination of v1 and v2, and that would look like this. Um, where a is the coefficient on v1 and b is the coefficient on v2. Now since v1 and v2 are orthogonal, we know by the definition of orthogonality, that means the dot product between v1 and v2 is zero. And so if we wanted to solve for a, we could take the dot product of both sides with v1, and that would get rid of the bv2 term, and vice versa if we wanted to solve for b, we would take the dot product of both sides with v2. So Doing v1 first, we take the dot product with v1 on both sides, and that will make the b term go away because v2 dot v1 is 0. And we can solve for a. Um, now we can substitute a, and you can solve for b on your own to put it back into the first equation. And you may see that those coefficients on v1 and v2 actually have a lot of meaning, but if you don't see it, you can sort of rewrite it where you can explain it through linear algebra terminology. So if you rewrite the uh, uh, right side of the equation like this, uh, you can then walk through uh, what's going on. So we take v3 and we project it, that's another word for taking the dot product, we project it onto the unit vector in the direction of v1, uh, that is v1 normalized. And then, since that output is a scalar, uh, that output being how much of v3 lies in v1, we then point it in the direction of v1 by multiplying it by the unit vector um, in the direction of v1, or v1 normalized again. Um, so yeah, that should help you understand why those coefficients come out to what they do. And the reason we can perform this math is because v1 and v2 were orthogonal. All right, let's think about how dot products with vectors can be extended to functions. So we'll start with a discrete function. Um, this should be pretty clear to see how a discrete function can take the form of a vector. So consider some function f of t equals 2 times t, where t takes discrete values 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we can rewrite f of t as a vector, and the components of the vector correspond to a sample at a discrete time. Uh, the first component of f is the sample at t equals 0, the second is the sample at t equals 1, so on. If some function g was in the same format as f, we could take the inner product which is another word for the dot product, um, but has sort of more extensive applications. Um, but in this case, it's the same thing. We multiply each component of f of t with the corresponding component of g of t and then sum them all together. And so the dot product or inner product of f with g is the sum of f times g. You take f times g and then sum from t equals 0 to t equals 4. Now we can extend this idea to continuous functions. Uh, you can now think of a continuous function as having infinite sampling intervals, in which case f of t and g of t, or vector f and vector g, grow infinitely in length. Um, they have an infinite amount of components. And in this case, the uh, inner product of f with g, the uh, outer sum now becomes an integral. And so 
the inner product between two continuous functions is the integral of the functions multiplied with each other. So now that we understand how to decompose a vector into a set of orthogonal basis vectors with the inner product, and we know that the inner product can be applied to functions, we're ready to derive the Fourier series. And we'll start with the real Fourier series. So we need a set of orthogonal basis functions. And for the real Fourier series, we use cosines and sines that have some integer multiple of a base frequency. And I'm going to use the base frequency of 1 over 2 pi. Uh, you can prove that these are orthogonal with the equations in the bottom right. If you want to see the actual proofs behind it, you can find them online pretty easily. I find the proofs that use trig identities to be the easiest to follow. And there's two inner products that I actually left out here, but they are important to know. Uh, one of them is cos k of t, where k is cos kt, where k is some positive integer with one, and the other is sine kt with one. And both of those inner products are zero, and that's because from minus pi to pi, cos and sine, uh, that are some positive integer multiple of the base frequency, uh, being one over two pi, have an equal amount of area above and below the x-axis. So we're going to represent a function as a sum of these orthogonal basis functions, being cosines and sines that are integer multiples of the base frequency 1 over 2 pi. And so let's take a look at this equation here. We have a sub 0 through a sub infinity, and we have b sub 1 through b sub infinity. So a sub 0 is the coefficient on either you can look at it as the function 1 or the function cos of n t where n is 0. Then a sub n is the coefficient on cos n t where n it goes from 1 to infinity. And b sub n is the coefficient on sine n t where n goes from 1 to infinity. And of course we have no b 0 because sine of 0 is 0. So just like in the first slide, when I was showing vectors, we can take the inner product on both sides with one of the orthogonal basis functions. And that will isolate the right side of the equation such that only the orthogonal basis function, only the orthogonal basis function's coefficient is, its term is left. The other terms will be negated or basically canceled out because the inner products will be zero. So if we were to try and find, say, some arbitrary a sub k, then we would use the inner product on both sides with cos kt to solve for a sub k. We know that a, we can take, uh, in this first inner product, a0 with cos kt, we could take a0 out of the integral and just leave 1. And as I said, the integral of cos kt from minus pi to pi is 0. Uh, for any cos nt where n does not equal k, the inner product of cos nt with cos kt will be zero. And for any sine nt, whether sine equals k or not, the integral with sine nt with cos kt is zero. So we're left with just a sub k, where n equals k, and we have cos kt, the inner product of cos kt with cos kt. And so this is what the right side will come out to. And uh, we know the integral of cos kt squared from minus pi to pi, that is pi. And so our equation for a sub k is 1 over pi times the inner product of f of t with cos kt. Or in other words, just like when we were using vectors, we have the... Uh, we have the inner product of f of t with the basis function cos kt all divided by the magnitude of cos kt squared from minus pi to pi. We can similarly do this for all the b sub k's using sine, uh, signs of positive integer multiples of uh, the base frequency as our basis functions to get b sub k, all our b sub k's. And for a sub 0, we will also have a special um, case, just because the 
function on a sub 0 is technically the function 1. Uh, anyways, at this point we've created the real Fourier series. We have an equation for all the coefficients to create an infinite series of our orthogonal basis functions, cosines and sines of positive integer multiples of the base frequency to represent some periodic function from minus pi to pi. Okay, so the complex Fourier series. Uh, I often seen it shown derived from the real Fourier series. Uh, basically, replacing cosine and sine in the real series with their complex exponential representations will yield the complex Fourier series, but with the big restriction, which is that your coefficients c sub n and c sub minus n have to be complex conjugates of each other. And so your output space remains purely real. And you'll see these coefficients in a sec. Uh, but for this reason, I like to take the same approach we did last time, where we come up with our own orthogonal basis functions. So our orthogonal basis function will be e to the i kt, um, where k goes from minus infinity to infinity. And the reason we are using negative frequencies now is that they are still orthogonal to each other with complex exponentials. But in the real series, we didn't need to use these because... Uh, say cos kt with cos minus kt and sine kt with sine minus kt those are uh, the cosines are linearly dependent with each other and the sines would be linearly dependent so it'd be redundant uh, but here it still helps us extend the orthogonal basis uh, if you're confused about e to the minus imt that's just the notation for taking a inner product in the complex plane you use the complex conjugate and so that's just uh, to ensure the axioms of the inner product still hold. And uh, if you want to see, again, why this proof of the um, e to the i kt and e to the i mt being orthogonal to each other when k does not equal m, uh, you can find that online. It's not too difficult. Um, and then, again, when k equals m, we get 2 pi. So we have our ortho orthogonal basis now. And we want to represent some function f of t as the sum of these orthogonal basis functions. Uh, where n goes from minus infinity to infinity, we'll have our c sub n, which will be our complex coefficients now. So, using the same technique to isolate for one of the basis functions, we'll get c sub k equals 1 over 2 pi times the inner product of f of t with e to the i k t. And again, we use the complex conjugate for inner products with complex functions. And that will give us the Fourier series, the complex Fourier series. Um, and so what I'm going to show next is an extension of the complex Fourier series where I'm going to take 2D drawings and um, approximate them with complex exponentials. So it's a, it's really cool to see this math sort of come to life. I'll link all the resources I used to make this video in the description. Um, so that'll be resources that was just from my research into the Fourier series. And uh, also um, the uh, links to the Python library that's used to create these Fourier series animations. Um, the Python library is called Manim. It was created by 3Blue1Brown. And the code I'm using to uh, animate my two-dimensional drawings is just uh, an extension to the source code that 3Blue1Brown used for his Fourier series video.